We should go boldly where man has not gone before. Fly by to comets, visit asteroids. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? The universe put it there. No Man's Sky, a game whose very name has inspired some of the most enthusiastic and vitriolic discourse in recorded human history. A game whose design and development has spawned innumerable think pieces even to this day, and a game that, as of December 31st, 2020, more than four years after launch, I have finally completed. But how exactly does one quote-unquote complete a procedurally generated game? A game where, prominently declared in the game's marketing materials, every atom of the game is procedural. Well, I don't know much about game design, and I know even less about the field of scientific study popularly known as atomic physics, aside from being able to recognize a Bohr model whenever I see one. But regardless of the actuality of such granular game design, or lack thereof, I have done what I set out to do in mid-August of 2016. My name is Jake Terrio, and you're about to hear the story of how I finally got to the galactic center of Hello Games' sci-fi opus, No Man's Sky. Well, ooh, 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 it's a thingy! What are you... This is amazing. Zoom in on, this is the zoom in thrill on. of discovery. Wow, what is it? What are you? <laughs> what? Ooh. What is it? Who are you? Are oh, you man. hostile? Are you people? No. Or are you just animals? It's aliens. If you've somehow clicked on this video and have never played or even seen the tiniest modicum of gameplay from No Man's Sky over the last four and a half years, let me get you up to speed. No Man's Sky is a procedurally generated space exploration game where you chart planets and systems and document plants and animals. No Man's Sky has a crafting system. No Man's Sky has an in-game economy. No Man's Sky has player-owned structures. From the assembly of these ingredients, we can determine that No Man's Sky is the EVE Online of Minecrafts by way of a high school biology class. No Man's Sky launched in August of 2016, and has since then received over a dozen free, major, and minor gameplay updates and expansions, culminating in the most recent release, No Man's Sky Next Generation. But our journey begins in the previous expansion, No Man's Sky Origins. When I first learned of No Man's Sky, it checked all the boxes I could imagine for a game crafted specifically to my particular tastes in science fiction. It so specifically checked those boxes that I did the bad thing and pre-ordered it. Space simulators have always fascinated me, especially space flight simulators, though it was often difficult to foment that same fascination in my childhood friends. No one. Not a single one of the friends of my youth ever wanted to play the space battles in Star Wars Battlefront 2. That is all I wanted to play in Star Wars Battlefront 2. Only one of my friends owned Jedi Starfighter for the Microsoft Xbox, but would only let me play it when he died. He was very good at Jedi Starfighter. I'm realizing also as I write this paragraph that at least 90% of the space flight simulator games I played as a kid were Star Wars in theme, Star Wars or Star Fox. Regular viewers of Subpixel content will know that sci-fi storytelling is my bread and butter. Space has always fascinated me, both the real and the fictional. My grandfather worked for North American Aviation on the Apollo program, and it was that real-world anchor that served as the jumping-off point for my fascination with space and space travel. Films like Apollo 13, The Right Stuff, Star Wars, 2001 A Space Odyssey, the art of folks like Roger Dean, Sid Mead, Robert McCall, Ralph McQuarrie, books like Dune, Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles, and even the Calvin and Hobbes Spaceman Spiff comic strips would further expand that fascination fascination into an obsession. Recently, someone I followed on Twitter retweeted a video of people looking at the moon through a telescope, and I cried. 
When, in the early 2000s, our local blockbuster video finally got Bionicle 2 Legends of Metru Nui in stock, I convinced a buddy of mine to rent us David Lynch's Dune instead. That's only half a joke. We did rent Dune and Bionicle 2 Legends of Metru Nui and watched them as a double feature, and it was very weird. Um, but it was also that my friend's dad would have had to rent the movies for us, so either he had never seen a David Lynch film in his life, or was more than okay with what those images would do to a couple of 11-year-olds. I write this script not as a mere player of games, or as a man with some passing pedestrian interest in space travel, but as a connoisseur of the intergalactic. As someone who saw gravity four times in theaters its first two weekends, who drove with friends three hours to see Interstellar projected on actual 70mm film, who grew up within walking distance of and spent many childhood hours in a place called Rocket Ship Park, not to be confused with Kennedy Space Center's Rocket Garden, in which I have have also spent many hours, who watched the final launch of the space shuttle Atlantis and the inaugural ascent and descent of SpaceX Falcon 9 from his backyard, who has only ever purchased one copy of Time magazine, and who for absolutely no practical reason owns a reprinting of NASA's old graphic standards manual. Do you know what the official fonts were for NASA in the 1970s? Because I do. If you follow me on social media, you may even know that I've written a science fiction novel, and have produced and been in a few sci-fi short films. I have built a spaceship. So while a great many people did not enjoy the very first iteration of No Man's Sky, I had genuine fun, rough edges and all. And that's not to say I gave the game a free pass or anything when it came to missing content or bugs or crashes, of which I encountered many during my first weeks exploring the Infinite Universe. I even independently published an article on Medium on August 23rd, 2016, entitled Who is to Blame for No Man's Sky? in which I speculated upon why No Man's Sky had launched in such a cyberpunk 2077-esque tumult, though not literally with such comparisons in mind. Now, I certainly did not agree with those folks out there who were sending bomb threats to the Hello Games office, but I did find myself agreeing with a great many reviews from the major gaming publications, some of which I went back and reread during the research portion of working on this video. One from Philip Collar for Polygon fairly well sums up the state of No Man's Sky in August of 2016 where Collar said, its mundanity can't begin to live up to the potential for awe produced by everything around it. I tended to agree also with Forbes writer Eric Kane when they said they were glad No Man's Sky exists and they're glad many players will love it for what it is, but that it's not a terrible game, it's simply not a very engaging one. But even amidst an objectively messy launch, there was a very specific kind of zen I felt flying about those colorful worlds and documenting the myriad flora and fauna of Hello Games' procedural planets. I have always enjoyed looking at nature, and I specifically use the verb looking here because I don't always like being out in nature. I love witnessing nature in controlled environments. I have vivid recollections of an olive garden near our home in Torrance, California. This particular olive garden was part of a large office park throughout which meandered a serene series of ponds and rivers. I would always request that we ourselves meander through this secluded oasis upon the conclusion of our meal, but more often than not my requests fell on deaf ears. There were always more pressing matters to attend to, like delivering Avon products to my mom's friends. Similar to the oasis behind the Olive Garden was a Japanese garden within the campus of our local Parks and Rec Center. I would sit in this garden before and after the fencing classes I briefly attended as a child. I loved looking at the trees and flowers, and watching the koi swim amongst the shallow pools of the garden was hypnotic. Similarly, I loved exploring the alien planets of No Man's Sky. The visual representation of No Man's Sky's worlds was one I couldn't get enough of. 
I even started creating my own encyclopedia of the worlds I'd traveled to, to perhaps one day sit alongside the Roger Dean and John Harris art books I have on my shelf. But for all that enjoyment, I never felt the urge to wend my way through the innumerable stars of that first galaxy to its center, where the game supposedly ended. And I'm not the kind of person to just give up on something if it's something I'd actually like to accomplish. I've got one of the Destiny 2 Gambit jerseys, which going off the stats from Braytech.org, less than 10% of players ever earned the ability to have. I knew from reviews and other folks' Let's Plays what would happen if I ever did complete that journey, so I wasn't phenomenally motivated to rush through the experience of No Man's Sky. My playtime was spent luxuriating upon each of No Man's Sky's millions of worlds, only leaving the surface of each wandering orb once I was content I'd seen all it had to offer. I played fairly often from launch to the Foundation update, but afterwards I played in increasingly irregular bursts often only hopping in for a few days at a time after each new update to test out the new systems and content. But it wasn't until the Origins update that I really felt hooked again, and finally voyaged to the center of the universe. But before we dive into my journey to the center of the known universe, let's take a look at the function of science fiction as a genre to better understand the thematic nature of No Man's Sky. Sci-fi author Judith Merrill, in a May 1966 article titled, What Do You Mean? Science? Fiction? For Extrapolation, the first academic journal to publish writings on science fiction and fantasy, and eventually many more forms of speculative fiction, including comics and video games, defined three kinds of science fiction. Teaching stories, which Merrill says serve primarily to popularize new scientific advancements, especially in such cases where there are political, religious, or academic pressures operating against them. Merrill cites the works of Arthur C. Clarke as often trafficking in this form of sci-fi. Preaching stories, which use the tools of sci-fi to create morality pieces and warnings aimed at the current conduct of human society. Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation would be one such work. And finally, speculative fiction, which Merrill says are stories whose objective is to explore, to discover, to learn something about the nature of the universe, or man, or reality. Most pulp sci-fi, the kinds whose covers Sean Murray often touted as aesthetic inspirations for No Man's Sky, would fall into this third category, as would No Man's Sky itself. Though No Man's Sky had only an implied narrative as of the launch of the game, the Atlas Rises update and many following No Man's Sky expansions introduced a more formal narrative into the infinite universe of No Man's Sky. This narrative is one of self-discovery, as your capital T Traveler discovers they are part of a massive, ongoing, ever-repeating simulation, and are eventually given the undesirable task of deciding the fate of said simulation. By Merrill's definition, your character in No Man's Sky is quite literally exploring and discovering things about the universe, and also about reality. In a meta-narrative sense, you may, by the actions of your traveler, learn something about yourself too, the quote, man of Merrill's speculative fiction. Science fiction is about asking questions, forcing the audience to wrestle with some specific concept or another. Sometimes the question and concept is obvious, like when Jeff Goldblum's Ian Malcolm rebukes the dinosaur cloners of Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park by saying, Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. In Crichton's original novel, the quote is slightly different, but the intent is the same. Scientists are actually preoccupied with accomplishment, so they are focused on whether they can do something. They never stop to ask if they should do something. The questions No Man's Sky asks are actually not as interesting as the questions it doesn't. The simulation of No Man's Sky explicitly asks whether it's better to be doomed to live in a repeating simulation or die. It asks about the ethics of making that choice for others. If you were the only one who knew about the simulation, would you choose to turn it off? However, I think the questions No Man's Sky doesn't ask are more important. Though No Man's Sky goes out of its way to inform the player of its simulated space, 
it would be relatively easy for a player to never encounter or never properly grapple with such messages. The game doesn't force you to read any of its text. You can button mash your way through dialogue boxes, and you never need to actually complete the main story. You could spend as much time as you wanted in the Euclid Galaxy, blissfully unaware of any neighboring simulations you could explore if you ever escaped your own. From such an ignorant perspective as I was at the launch of No Man's Sky until the introduction of the formal story with the Atlas Rises update, the themes I took away from No Man's Sky were much different. I found myself wrestling with isolation. I knew intellectually that there were others out there amongst the stars, charting planets and taxonomizing local plants and animal species, but I knew I'd never see them. And they may never see me. They may never even find any of the worlds I'd discover. If I died and the worlds I'd explored were never found by anyone else, had I explored them at all? Was my time amongst the stars wasted? I don't think so. In the 1987 Rush song Prime Mover, Canadian lyricist and philosopher Neil Peart eloquently restated an oft-repeated and familiar sentiment, the point of the journey is not to arrive. Exploration in No Man's Sky and in life is its own reward. This is what I took away from No Man's Sky 1.0. We'll talk more about the narrative and its implications later, but I wanted to put these thoughts in your mind before we continue. Before No Man's Sky Origins launched on September 23rd, 2020, Ian and Will had decided that No Man's Sky would be the next title we'd play as part of Subpixel's Sandbox stream series, since most of the team, besides me, hadn't played much of the game since launch. I was the only person who'd played any of the recent content, and even at that, the most recent update I'd played was No Man's Sky Beyond in August of 2019. We'd all agreed to make new saves before heading into Origins Live on stream, so each of us spent a few hours grinding through the now fairly hefty tutorial required to get new and returning players up to speed with the vast swaths of new content that had been added to No Man's Sky since its 2016 launch. I recorded most of my play during that off-stream tutorial section, knowing that more than likely I'd have use for the footage down the line. We'd recently released a video for our Spotlight series documenting the development, launch, and subsequent free expansions to No Man's Sky, in which I included footage I'd recorded at various times during my previous three years playing the game, and with no signs that new No Man's Sky expansions weren't just going to randomly drop at any moment, I pressed record on my tedious first flights through the Infinite Universe. And so, with the new tutorialization completed, we played No Man's Sky on stream for the next five weeks. I had so much fun during those streams that I knew I was going to keep playing once the stream series was over. I felt like I was finally seeing the vision of No Man's Sky that everyone had been talking about in the years before the game's tumultuous 2016 release. At the end of our stream series, I'd logged some 24-ish hours on my new save, and as of typing these words on this page, that number has ballooned to 50 hours of playtime. I reached the galactic center around hour 58 of gameplay. By way of my own morbid curiosity, I discovered that per the logs of users on HowLongToBeat.com, the average completion time for No Man's Sky is just over 57 hours. I did not, however, reach the end of No Man's Sky as I understood it to be in No Man's Sky 1.0. Though the desired outcome was the same, progress far enough to finally leave the original galaxy and reawaken in a completely new one, to begin the cycle of exploration anew, it was not by naturally flying to the galactic center, as was the only way to advance to a new galaxy at No Man's Sky's launch. With each of No Man's Sky's many updates, new narrative content and quests were introduced to add some meat onto the skeleton that was No Man's Sky 1.0. One of these quests is how I finally reached the end of the Starter Galaxy, and emerged into a whole new world. This, then, is my journey to that new world of No Man's Sky Origins. Music 
It was interesting as the content of No Man's Sky expanded and my options for how to play the game expanded, a unique internal narrative developed during my fresh origin save, a specific way I ventured through the stars. Sure, there was a main story for me to complete, added in No Man's Sky 1.3 Atlas Rises, and expanded upon in subsequent updates, but that's not what my explorer was interested in. Instead, I found myself casually proceeding towards the galactic core, amassing resources and ships along the way, stopping on aesthetically pleasing planets to document the landscape, and investigating long-lost ruins and ships. At least at first. My motivations would change the closer I got to the core of the universe. One of my weaknesses as a player of any game with stats tied to objects is that I will more often than not choose the most aesthetically pleasing options rather than those with the best stats. No Man's Sky was, and is, no exception. In No Man's Sky 1.0 through No Man's Sky 3.0, my primary objective, rather than fly to the center of the universe, was recovering crashed spaceships and, once personal freighters were added to the game, amass a personal collection of the best-looking spaceships I could find. This was, at first, also my primary goal in No Man's Sky Origins. A few new items had been added to the in-game economy of No Man's Sky to further this goal of beautiful space garage. But most of the time I relied on the tried and true method of tracking down transmission towers to locate wrecked ships. I knew also of a quest line added in the Living Ship update that would allow me to acquire a semi-sentient organic vessel, though that goal was much further down the line, as the currency required to purchase the item to start the quest was not easily attainable during our first weeks of streaming Origins gameplay. I finally got my Living Ship AFTER I reached the center of the first galaxy, but we'll come back to that specific tangent of my voyage later. I discovered during my first few ship salvaging expeditions that some new gameplay mechanics and economic opportunities had been added since I'd last played No Man's Sky. Previously, if I encountered a crashed ship that I didn't like the look of, I'd briefly claim it, dismantle what of its technology I could, and abscond back to my previous vessel with my ill-gotten raw materials. But now I had the option of flying salvaged ships to a nearby space station and scrapping them for parts, which could then be sold on the open market. Functionally, the outcome of this new process was the same as before, but with a bit more interactivity, making the loop of search for wreck, repair wreck, make money from wreck far more interesting than during my previous journeys through No Man's Sky. But there were two other economic opportunities that called out to me during this voyage to the Galactic Center that, combined with my finding, repairing, and scrapping of lost ships, allowed me the financial freedom to traverse the galaxy as luxuriously as I desired. I recalled that in No Man's Sky 1.0, it was not as easy as one might imagine to earn money. The only things I was interested in purchasing in No Man's Sky 1.0 were new spaceships. I never spent much time trading on the market, only selling off excess goods in order to build up a new starship expense account. In No Man's Sky 1.0, many ships I encountered could be purchased for six figures, but most of the non-player spacefarers I encountered wouldn't part with their vessels for less than seven. Without going back and double-checking all the footage I recorded back then, I don't recall many materials or commodities selling for more than high five-figure amounts. I was always short on cash in No Man's Sky 1.0. But, like I said, Origins had many new economic avenues to travel down, the first of which I found was archaeology. Through the scanning function of your starship, you can see the geologic makeup of a nearby planet, and often any other interesting resources that might be hidden just beneath the surface. Early in my Origins voyage, I saw a planet that, according to my scanner, contained ancient bones. I landed on the planet, found one of these natural burial sites, and recovered what archaeological wonders I could. Needless to say, these objects sold for much more than anything I'd yet experienced in No Man's Sky, with some rare finds selling for upwards of two million units, No Man's Sky's nondescript primary currency. 
But this new economic avenue, though financially beneficial for my wandering explorer, shone a light onto one of the more troublesome aspects of No Man's Sky. It's dance with colonialism. The Oxford Dictionary defines colonialism as the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically. When you land on a planet in No Man's Sky, you will inevitably do one or more of those things in any combination. Now I know this is going to sound a lot like Edge Magazine's famous If Only You Could Talk to These Creatures review of Doom 1993, but hear me out. The biggest problem with No Man's Sky, even from its very first days, is its survival mechanic. Not in that it has one, but with the survival mechanic's implications during gameplay. You cannot fly from planet to planet, or even walk across the surface of a planet, without the right resources. Your ship needs fuel. One type for launch, one type for sublight travel from planet to planet, and one special fuel type to jump from system to system. Your exosuit needs oxygen and batteries for your life support and environmental protection. And your multi-tool needs a variety of fuels to power your arsenal of terraforming and combat mechanisms. Unless you're playing in creative mode, there is no way around these requirements. You'll need to pilfer the countryside for raw materials in order to craft the resources you'll need to survive. Which wouldn't necessarily be a problem if not for one thing. The sovereignty of the alien races of No Man's Sky. Discovery in No Man's Sky is remarkably Columbusonian. You'll never actually come across any planets that aren't already populated, or don't already contain alien artifacts and monuments as evidence of a previous populace. Everywhere has already been discovered and settled, just not documented in whatever celestial travelogue every capital T Traveler's Discoveries are uploaded to from the menu. This process of discovery is doubly peculiar when you realize that not only are all these systems and planets already inhabited, but they're also already named. However, regardless of this fact, No Man's Sky lets you rename any planet you quote, discover, if you so choose. And when you do this, the game gives you money. Thanks, Space Ferdinand and Isabella. But are you breaking any laws by doing this? Are you treading upon any previously standing treaties between alien races? What consequences must there be for violating the land of these creatures? I don't think Hello Games strove to make a colonialist game, but the implication is there nonetheless. And if I were a British game developer, I would have definitely tried to make a game without any colonialist or imperialist implications. Well, at least the resources you gather from these planets is only used to help you get to the next planet and not to build expansive structures and cities across the breadth of your domain. Well, person who has never played this game before, do I have news for you! Mere months after No Man's Sky launched, base building was added to the game. When the Foundation update was launched and I first had the opportunity to build a base on a planet, I chose planets that were beautiful, places I'd want to set up a permanent residence. But in my Origins playthrough, I chose planets rich in resources like ancient bones or the equally profitable salvageable scrap. With the introduction of Exocraft in the Pathfinder update, I was able to traverse the surface of these planets with incredible speed, exponentially increasing the rate at which I could harvest bones or salvage scrap. And like all things in No Man's Sky, base building ignores the sovereignty of those aliens who already exist upon the planets you're occupying. And sure, it wouldn't make for a very interesting or fun game to have to get building clearances and land rights from some kiosk in the local space station and have to settle disputes with the Celestial Public Works Department, but then at least you wouldn't be participating in this unspoken imperialist venture of the game's capital T travelers. Similarly, no one asks any questions when you fly a recovered spaceship to orbit to scrap it at the local space station. 
How do they know you didn't kill that ship's pilot and are scrapping it not just for the money, but also to destroy the evidence? Well, narratively, Hello Games has written themselves out of any consequence from the colonialist gameplay all but mandated by the gameplay loop of No Man's Sky. As previously mentioned, all of the events of No Man's Sky occur within a Matrix-esque simulation, overseen by the game's enigmatic Atlas entity. What this means is that when you land on a planet already occupied by another race of alien being and walk up to a stack of crates on their landing pad and take whatever goods you can from within, it has all the consequence of the real world you or I instructing our player characters to take carrots from a Minecraft village and not replant them. By taking resources from No Man's Sky's aliens or Minecraft's villagers, we don't worry that they might not have a full meal that night. It's all simulated, and as such, there are no stakes to your actions. Bottom line, does this colonialist implication make No Man's Sky a bad game? Not at all. Only that it causes a certain amount of dissonance with the supposed intentions of the gameplay of No Man's Sky. If the goal of the game is exploration and discovery, then Hello Games would have been better served to not include any survival mechanics and lean more into the walking simulator aspect of No Man's Sky. But I understand that for most players, this would have been a less interesting game. If any of the alien races in No Man's Sky were to have creation myths at all resembling our own here on Earth, one might say they believed in unintelligent design. Now I want to take a moment to talk about No Man's Sky's famously touted procedural generation. No Man's Sky is absolutely gigantic. For as broad an expanse as No Man's Sky claims to be, the pieces of its procedural puzzle become apparent after a handful of planets. New biomes introduced in later updates help to stave off this terrestrial repetition for a time, but eventually you'll find yourself arriving on planets that feel all too familiar, albeit reskinned and palette swapped for a different chromatic flare. At launch, the procedural generation of No Man's Sky was the one thing that really worked. But to revisit Philip Collar's review, No Man's Sky's mundanity could not begin to live up to the potential for awe produced by everything around it. So as No Man's Sky was updated and expanded over the past four years, its mundanity was eventually peeled away to make room for real, compelling gameplay. As a consequence of this gamification of No Man's Sky, as everything else became more interesting, the algorithms tasked with creating the many systems of this game's vast universe became the most mundane part of the whole experience. And I don't think this is the fault of the tools Hello Games has used to procedurally generate No Man's Sky, but rather the fault of No Man's Sky's scale. I know I'm beginning to sound like I'm contradicting myself. I said that I enjoyed and enjoy No Man's Sky, but think that the scale of the game makes it more mundane than it should be, when the grand scale of No Man's Sky is supposed to be one of the game's primary selling points. No Man's Sky is, for lack of a better taxonomy, a roguelike open-world exploration game. It was and is audacious, to be sure, but No Man's Sky's roguelike and open-world elements begin to butt up against one another once the player has spent enough time in its world. Roguelikes, in most cases, are much smaller, focused ventures than open-world games. Roguelikes tend to focus more on gameplay than narrative, since their randomness doesn't often cater to traditionally linear storytelling. Open world games, as their name would imply, are vast, sprawling experiences, and tend to focus on grand narratives spread across the breadth of their domain. No Man's Sky tries to have the best of both worlds. In some cases, the game succeeds, like in the random interstellar fleet battles you might occasionally warp into. But for the most part, the narrative functions of No Man's Sky take a back seat to the narratives the player makes for themselves as they wander through the stars. I want to take a look at two similar exploratory spacefaring games and why I think their galaxies are more compelling than that of No Man's Sky, despite each game being far smaller and having fewer things to do over the course of play. Santa Regione's Mirror Moon EP and Mobius Digital's Outer Wilds are both phenomenal science fiction adventures on a remarkably smaller scale than that of No Man's Sky. 
But regardless of their size compared to No Man's Sky, neither Mirror Moon nor Outer Wilds feel small. Both have plenty to see and do. Mirror Moon uses procedural generation like No Man's Sky, but Outer Wilds is, as proudly proclaimed in the game's marketing materials, a handcrafted solar system. If No Man's Sky is creation through chaos, Outer Wilds is anything but. Outer Wilds is levels of magnitude smaller than No Man's Sky, but it feels like a living, breathing galaxy, unlike the odd sterility of the universe of No Man's Sky. Outer Wilds' planets are slightly larger than those in Mirror Moon, but still small enough that you can easily chart the whole surface of any planet in a reasonable amount of time. Everything in Outer Wilds feels planned out, but not in a way that makes you feel like the devs at Mobius Digital are guiding you down any one set path. The process of discovery in Outer Wilds is immaculately organic, and always awe-inspiring. And it's because the experience is curated, rather than randomly generated. If I were in charge of the narrative team for No Man's Sky, I would have taken a page from Outer Wilds and made three or four handcrafted systems specifically for the single-player experience. Some missions in No Man's Sky already require all players to go to the same specific planet, like at the end of the Living Ship questline, but these planets were still, at one point, fabricated by the procedural generation that serves as the bedrock of No Man's Sky. If these planets were handcrafted instead of procedural, the eventual visual and textural monotony of the late game of No Man's Sky could theoretically be avoided, at least in the context of the primary narrative. If one were to split No Man's Sky into two explicitly single-player and multiplayer experiences. But this kind of handcraftedness is beside the point. No Man's Sky's key selling point is its giganticness as provided by its methods of procedural creation. But it is too huge. It is so huge that it quickly becomes uninteresting. This is why Mirror Moon's procedurally generated planets work. You'll only spend a few minutes on any one planet in Mirror Moon, but this isn't because the planet is boring or because it doesn't have anything meaningful for you to discover, but because that's literally how long it will take you to traverse the whole planet. I imagine I could spend the better part of several months charting and documenting every landmark on a given planet in No Man's Sky. As such, every planet in No Man's Sky, though often populated by one of the game's three alien races, feel remarkably empty. You'll come across shelters, observatories, trading posts, and other buildings on each planet's surface, but they're often only occupied by one or two creatures, if occupied at all. Trading posts are larger, and as such often occupied by half a dozen or so alien beings, but none of these planets ever feel populated. If I'd come across even one planet with a Los Santos-sized city on it, it would have made everything feel a little more real. Now, something I'm sure I could confirm or deny if I dug through the patch notes of No Man's Sky long enough is that it feels like buildings spawn more infrequently in these later versions of No Man's Sky than they did at launch. I do not know if that's truly the case, but I recall my first days playing No Man's Sky just wandering from distant building to distant building, and never really spending much time searching for another landmark to travel to. Another building or artifact was always on the horizon. I spent nearly five hours on my first planet in No Man's Sky 1.0, in part because I was still learning how to play, but also because I kept finding new things to explore, keeping my desire to launch into orbit at bay. In No Man's Sky 3.0, I felt aimless, apart from coordinates tagged on the HUD. Rarely did I ever see a new settlement on the horizon. I had to search for them technologically, or with coordinates purchased from locals. But with more methods by which to locate artifacts, structures, and settlements than in the launch version of No Man's Sky, this theoretical loss of alien population density was essentially moot. The myriad explorable systems of No Man's Sky do not feel lived in. Which on one level is kind of the point, that you're the first person exploring these systems, but the fact that alien races are included at all makes the lack of these kinds of familiar spaces all the more eerie. Now I'm obviously well into the rabbit hole of armchair game dev, which I'll be the first to claim I'm outrageously unqualified for, but I do know that tools exist to procedurally generate cities. Oscar Stahlberg's Townscaper is one such tool, though one released well after the launch of No Man's Sky. 
Oscar's been working with procedural tools for much longer though, with some of his prototypes like Polyagonal Planet Project, Brick Block, and a browser-based Island Editor informing the design of plausible concepts Viking Pillaging Simulator Bad North, and the procedural city generation in Monkey Moon's Night Call, both of which Oscar worked on directly. But I don't think procedural generation is the be-all end-all for the faults of No Man's Sky. The path I'm mentally traveling down is one that will quickly overcomplicate itself. Sure, you might be able to procedurally generate a Los Santos or Night City-sized metropolis using the pool of blueprints already in the game as part of base building, and you might be able to populate it with some kind of realistically responsive populace, but this too would still feel unreal. One of my biggest gripes with open world games that I know I share with Kyle Bailey, one of the other producers here at Subpixel, is that in order for open world games to not overcomplicate themselves, a lot of their cities are smoke and mirrors. In Grand Theft Auto V, there are a lot of things to do in Los Santos, but I'd estimate that all of that content probably accounts for less than 10% of everything in Los Santos. I can't explore every building. I can't interact with every object. And I fully understand why. Perhaps one day game engines will be able to handle that kind of simulation where I can actually and realistically interact with the whole of an open world city, but we're not there yet. And without procedural generation, it would be completely unreasonable to ask the staff of a company as small as Hello Games to build a Los Santos sized city on every planet in No Man's Sky. It's more than a little unfair for me to even mention Hello Games and companies like CD Projekt Red or Rockstar Games in the same sentence. CDPR and Rockstar are huge AAA companies with hundreds of employees building their huge open worlds. But Hello Games is, for all intents and purposes, an indie company. The one that, with Sony's financial backing, is somewhere between indie and AAA. Airship Syndicate's Ryan Stefanelli calls these kinds of studios triple I, and I think that's a good taxonomy. I used this voyage to better acquaint myself with the fleet management system, eventually amassing quite an armada, and frequently sending those ships out on missions to systems I would not otherwise have been able to explore. But this too brushes up against the colonialist implications of No Man's Sky's gameplay, as certain fleet missions and exploratory routes will set your contracted spacefarers against the local populace, violently settling disputes between alien nations and stripping resources from nearby systems, all seemingly without any input from other, more appropriate stakeholders. This cycle of hire fleet, fuel fleet, send fleet on mission, reap bountiful rewards became my primary gameplay focus around the 30th hour of my voyage. At this point I was all but ignoring any sort of true exploratory obligations, only scanning flora and fauna not to formally document them but because I'd acquired a multi-tool upgrade that dramatically increased the number of units I'd receive from successfully scanned biology and geology. The further I traverse towards the center of the galaxy, the less time I spent on each planet and in each system, sometimes not spending more than a few minutes in any given system, if only to orbitally scan its planets for resources before warping away to more economically profitable worlds. Eventually, the primary quest line would lead me to the Galactic Center. I played a few hours after that, but until another update is released, I've gotten about all I ever could have wanted out of No Man's Sky. The meta-narrative of No Man's Sky's development and updates reads like a history of human expansion. No Man's Sky 1.0 was the dawn of man, but with each new update the universe of the travelers expanded. People began building their own cities, fleets began to travel between stars, planets became more populous than before, star systems generated economies, and soon megastructures began to pop up on the surface of certain worlds. Travelers began to build their own cities in lieu of the metropolis their neighboring alien races couldn't or wouldn't build on their own. New universes were discovered as the reach of the travelers exponentially grew. In our previous video on the release and development of No Man's Sky, I posited that if you're the kind of player who was dead set on playing the version of No Man's Sky that you expected to play in August of 2016, then No Man's Sky will never be the game you want it to be.
But it's at a point now where there are so many avenues by which you can experience and participate in No Man's Sky that whatever you were expecting from No Man's Sky in 2016 is irrelevant. It is so much more now than it was promised to be then. I greatly enjoyed my time with No Man's Sky, and even if Hello Games never releases any new content for No Man's Sky, which they'd have every right not to, absolutely none of No Man's Sky's expansions have cost the consumer absolutely anything apart from patience, I'm pleased with the game No Man's Sky has become. Flying, especially from surface to orbit, and vice versa, is immensely enjoyable. There's an almost viscous feeling to slicing through the atmosphere of a new planet. I love it. Hello Games could easily have turned No Man's Sky into a game service with cosmetic microtransactions and fully priced expansions every year, but they didn't. No Man's Sky has been, and is, a labor of love. Whatever rests beyond the horizon of Hello Games' development schedule, I await it with anticipation. So as we're here at the start of a new console generation, what would you like to see from No Man's Sky and Hello Games? Do you want to see more expansions to No Man's Sky, or perhaps a sequel? Or maybe something totally different? Let us know in the comments, and we'll see you in the next video. Hey everybody, this is Jake Terrio with Subpixel. If you've made it this far, hopefully it means you enjoyed that video that you just watched. So if you could leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you're not subscribed already, that lets us and our robot overlords at YouTube know that this video is worth watching. So thank you for that, and we'll see you next time.